Good morning. We're going to be reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The birth of Jesus Christ. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Owen. And good morning again, everyone. I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. And that is that uh, to you, a Savior has been born. We are in the uh, third week of Advent today. And uh, Really excited about the text that we have before us. We've been thinking about the incarnation. Two weeks ago, we thought about the, uh, the mystery of the incarnation when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and tells her that even though she's a virgin, she's going to have a child. And then last week, we thought about the joy of the incarnation in Mary's Magnificat, where she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And... Uh, Sully, as he preached, delved into this idea of the incarnation bringing us great joy. Today, what I want to focus on is the, what, what's the foundation of our joy? Why is it that the incarnation is a reason for great joy? Because what, what the angel says is, I bring you good news of great joy. And he says this will be for all the people. So the text really that I want to focus on is kind of the connection there between verses 10 and 11 and draw your attention there because when you see the word for, for to you is given or to you is born this Savior, it's giving the foundation of what our joy is going to be. So what I want to do today is just unpack for you the the foundation of the joy that we have in the incarnation. And uh, just for those of you who are not familiar with the term incarnation, it comes from the Latin meaning incarne, that is to, to actually be in the flesh. And the theological idea is that for many, many, <laughs> for all of history, into eternity past, the second person of the Trinity, who we know is Jesus, existed without a body, and it's through the conception in Mary, in her womb, that this kingdom comes. From this one conception comes this kingdom. So that's what the incarnation means. And I'm just going to give you three reasons today for uh, the, the foundation of joy in the incarnation, three reasons for joy in the incarnation. And for those of you who need a little clickbait, uh, the second one will shock you, Okay. That didn't go over so well, I guess. Uh, I'm just going to give you three reasons. The first reason comes from verses 1 to 7. And uh, it, I'm going to focus there on, on this, what I'll call this empire toppling manger. All right. The second one comes from verses 8 through 12. And it's really simply, it's the Savior. And then what I want to do is just tell, what, tell us why this incarnation is for us and think through a few of the impl implications of uh, what it means that Christ is born into the world, or what the incarnation means in terms of being a foundation of joy. So will you pray with me now? Our Father in heaven, we thank you that to us a Savior is given, and that this Savior is for all people, not for one kind of people, not for people from 
religious backgrounds, not for people who are somehow Catholic or Methodist or Protestant, but for all people, those who have never heard the name of Jesus, those who have never thought of themselves as religious, those who have never even lifted their hearts or their minds to the heavens being split open with the glory of an angel, all people, the humble ones who are here today in the service. So we quiet our hearts before you today, O oh God. And we get so distracted and tired of the jingles of Christmas and its secular celebration. Help us to penetrate to the heart of the incarnation, to the joy of the incarnation, to the foundation of the incarnation. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I want to just be answering two questions today. Why is the incarnation a foundation for worldwide joy? Why is the incarnation a foundation for worldwide joy? And what is the foundational joy of the incarnation itself? It's not easy, I know, uh, being working in the city of Chicago. One of the hardest jobs, I think, for young people who are idealistic and uh, want to make a difference in the world is to go into the, the line of social work. And I say that because, uh, well, social work actually has its foundations here in Chicago. Shout out to University of Illinois at Chicago and uh, the whole house and Jane Adams. But what often happens is those who have a kind of soft heart for people on the margins feel a call to social work and they go into social work and then what happens is they, are encount they encounter this crushing institutionalism and bureaucracy. In other words, what happens is somebody who wants to work with children who have parents who have abandoned them, they suddenly have a caseload of 350 children and only get to spend a sliver of time with each child or each family. And then the rest of their time is filling out paperwork. And they realize not just the anonymity of a big city with so many who are needy, but also what I'm calling this kind of crushing bureaucracy and institutionalism that shows the corruption actually in the fall manifested in, in institutions themselves. There's a, a book that came out this year called The Invisible Child. And some of you may have known about it. It uh, was reviewed in the New York Times recently and the, the reviewer Ted Conover said this, as I read this book, I kept picturing the mo a momentous round of Jenga, that game where you put, you know, build this tower. And he said, he, as he pictured the, the building of this tower of kind of bureaucracy, in the case of this one particular woman, it's like they, they were building this tower, but every time something happened in the bureaucracy, it was as if a, a, a plank was taken out, and so the whole foundation was about to fall down. The book is about, follows the life of a young homeless girl whose name is Dasani Cooper, and she grew up in a family so poor that her stepfather once pulled out his own gold teeth and pawned them in order to pay the bills that week. Her father that was in her home used to make, when he was a little boy, he made a, a kind of sandwiches that he called wish sandwiches. And what he would do is he'd pour some sugar in between two pieces of white bread and wish that God would give him something else and then eat that bread. The book is called The In Invisible Child, Poverty, Survival, and Hope in an American City because it contrasts the immensity of New York and all of its complexity with one child who cannot get her way out of poverty. And the author follows this child over a number of years. This morning, I want to think about what might be called another invisible child. There's an interesting contrast in verses 1 to 7 that you might call the contrast between two kingdoms. Or the city of man and the city of God. Because in the first two verses, you see the, the power of Caesar Augustus to disrupt the entire Roman Empire by telling everybody to go to their hometown. Can you imagine having the power 
to just cause an immediate mass migration of everybody leaving the town in which they are living now and then migrating to another town. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of people moving from one place to another. You're talking about Mary and Joseph. Mary, nine months pregnant, pacing her way from Nazareth to Bethlehem so that the hometown of David would become the hometown of Jesus, and that would be where he would be born. It takes about, um, you can, you can, most people can walk about three miles an hour. Um, it's about 80 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. So that's like 26 some hours. Maybe you can do, I don't know, five or six hours a day if you're pregnant. This would take five or six days for a pregnant woman. Then no cars, no trains, um, no f- speeding Teslas to get you there. Like that'd just take us less than an hour, or depending on how fast you go, I guess. It would take about an hour and a half. But here's Mary trudging her way. Maybe if she was very fortunate, she's on a, a beast of burden and, and you've seen paintings of Joseph walking beside her. But the contrast here is between the power of Caesar Augustus and Quirinius and his ability to waive his order or his decree and then all of the Roman Empire to sort of be capsized and for Mary and Joseph to ride on the wave of the power of this vast institution and bureaucracy. And yet what Luke is saying is keep an eye on this invisible child. (laughs) Keep an eye on the unnoticed one. Keep an eye on the manger. Keep an eye on the one who has no room at the inn. Because this one will topple all empires. The manger is going to overthrow the throne. I had a seminary professor who, when he uh, was teaching us about um, narrative, he said, you've got to think about narrative that is, Old Testament narrative or the Gospels, New Testament narrative, as being a little bit like a musical. That it's all woven together with the, with, with the story and with the details, but that every once in a while there's a song that breaks out. And he says, it's like a musical that you need to pay attention to the song because some of the theological meaning is in the song. And Mary's Magnificat is an interpretive lens for everything that's going to happen. In other words, the reader, as they read chapter 1 and then come to chapter 2, and they hear of this child that's being born in this manger, this overlooked one, this one who seems so humble, when Caesar seems so exalted, the learned reader will pay attention to the Magnificat and realize that what God is doing is taking the mighty and taking them down. And he's taking the humble and he's lifting them up. (laughs) That's what's happening in verses 1 to 7. So Luke is saying that this one who is born into the manger is going to do exactly what is said in the Magnificat. Listen, this is verse 47. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my soul, this is Mary, thinking about the child in her and prophesying. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, and in the Gospel of Luke, Over and over, Luke is pointing out to the humble and saying, keep your eye on them. Keep your eye on the invisible ones at the margins of society, for they will rise up and overthrow all power. She she continues, verse 49, For mighty is he who has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. (laughs) Yes, Caesar Augustus can show his power and make a decree that everyone is to be registered. But in the midst of the registration, there comes an incarnation. And the incarnation is what Luke wants you to pay attention to. Listen to verse 52. This could be the theme of verses 1 to 7. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the humble of estate. Chapter 2, verse 1, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus 
was the governor of Syria. You should know that Caesar Augustus, we, a, a Roman or a Greek in the first century would already know this, but Caesar Augustus was considered to be a god. Or to be a, they, they literally called him in some of the epigrams, the son of Zeus. So when he, when he died, they said that the, the son of Zeus has died or the son of God has died. Luke is playing with the irony here that the one who is seen to be the powerful son of God is going to be deposed even as the infant son of God is born. Listen for who the uh, registration is for, that all the world should be registered. Everyone. Which is why it's so beautiful in a moment when the angel proclaims and says, this news is for all the people. It's a contrast of the power of Caesar Augustus to issue a proclamation for all people. And yet an angel to issue a proclamation for all people as well. Daniel tells us, Isaiah tells us, that the kingdom of God is going to overcome and overthrow and uproot the kingdoms of this world. That Daniel, when he sees the vision of that great idol in his dream and the foundation or the feet of it are, are, are clay, it's an image of the Roman Empire being struck by the kingdom of God and being toppled. All that is what Luke is referencing here. The overthrow of the thrones by a manger. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea. Again, this is about 80 miles north of Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the, the city of bread. Because he was of the house and lineage of David. If you remember, the Old Testament tells us that, uh, that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. And so this is a fulfillment of that prophecy. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. As you know, a manger is a place where beasts eat, or cows, the French manger, we get similar word, means to eat. Here's this child king of the universe, is laid in this food trough. I don't know if you've ever seen pigs eating or watched them being slopped when I was younger, about seven years old. Went over to a neighbor's house when I lived after suburban, then urban, then urban living. Had some rural living and uh, went over to the neighbor's house and they had tons of pigs and watched them pour out the slop and then the pigs just come and crush all the garbage that was in there into a, in a feeding trough. That's where Jesus was laying. And he says, because there was no place for them in the inn. Some scholars think that's not the best translation to say the inn there, but that this might but that some of the houses in those days would have had three partitions, kind of a main room, a guest room, and then the the, the animal area. Some people actually the scholars say that the the animal area had an opening in it so that you could go directly from the living room or not leave it to feed the animals there. And the inn, this word for inn, some scholars say, is actually the word for the guest room, sort of. But the idea is that there was, this isn't, um, this isn't a hotel, so to speak, and you check in and sorry, we don't have any vacancies, you can go be in the barn, similar. But they, some scholars think actually it's just saying that there was no room in the guest room and they had to go be with the animals. In any case, this is where Jesus is laying. This is what you might call the, the subversive manger. The first foundation for the joy of the incarnation is that this humble manger will topple all of the thrones of power and outlast them. That's what uh, Luke is putting our attention to there as we look at that text. One scholar says, God doesn't break into the world as a world leader, as a Führer, or as a cosmic hero, all of which Caesar Augustus epitomized, God penetrates the defensive armor of the world by sending his son as a child. Not to the well-connected and the well-established, 
but as we'll see in a moment, to the shepherds at the precarious margins of society. In his book, uh, You Are Not Your Own, Alan Noble says that we gravitate towards judging value by what is quantifiable. Mostly in your work, you probably are measured by how much you do. The, the kind of technocracy of the day measures everything, just as Caesar Augustus wanted to measure, but the true place of value and the true place of power here was by something that was someone who was immeasurable. You may be familiar with a, a book by Jacques Ellul where he uh, writes about technopoly. And in the book, he, he says that technique has taken over the whole of civilization. This imagery of a vast, crushing bureaucracy, the death, procreation, and birth all submit to technical efficiency and systemization. Are you nothing but a statistic? Is that all you are? The manger says no, that there's a new non-statistical community that God is bringing into being where the value of the individual is not measured by how many outputs they, they give in the midst of one day, but by the new kingdom that he is bringing on the earth and the possibility of participating in that kingdom. What will break us free? The manger, the food trough, there's no ro room for them in the end. Alul also says, God's kingdom born unnoticed will overthrow all human kingdoms. The emperor of Rome will be to deposed by the rule of all reality and history. So what's the reason for our hope or our, our optimism, our joy in the incarnation? One is that we have this manger that will topple all throws, thrones. The second one is from verses 8 to 12 is simply that we have a savior. That's a simple way of saying it. I'll say it a little more complicated way in just a moment. But take, take a look at verse 8. It says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you that we will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. I'm going to just put this more complexly. The second foundation of our joy is really rooted here in verses 8 through 12. But what, what Luke is saying is that the joy of the incarnation is this lowly embracing, this shepherd embracing, glory filling, universally welcoming Messiah, Savior, and Lord. This lowly embracing, glory filling, good news bringing, joy dominating, universally welcoming Messiah. Let me just break, down, break this down. We sang a little bit of go, what child is this? And that's really the point here. It's the child who brings the incarnational joy. Here's a child that will join the heavens and the earth. I don't know if you noticed what's happening in verse 8. It's very symbolic. You have the shepherds in the field, and then verse 9, the angel appears in the heavens to them. In other words, what it's saying is this child who's going to come is going to embrace the lowly and then bring glory into the earth. If you think of what a shepherd was in those days, they're the like basic, sturdy workmen of the day. This would be like saying, and the angels appeared to the plumbers while they were plumbing, or to the lawyers while they were lawyering. I was trying to pick a, a vocation that is despised sometimes in our culture. The shepherds were the ones that nobody really wanted to associate with. And he comes to the lost and to the least and to the lonely. Why? Because he is exalting those who are of humble estate and he's bringing the mighty down from their thrones. You've seen maybe some of the paintings of the shepherds where Rembrandt is painted and <laughs> that the fear is like totally present in his paintings where some are running away. They're absolutely terrified. In other words, falling down in worship on his knees. But it gives this picture of the terror of the angel 
Why? Because somebody is being born into the world who's going to rule both the heavens and the earth. So he brings glory above and brings the message to the most lowly who are the shepherds. Not only does he embrace the lowly and bring glory, but he comes with this little phrase, good news of great joy. Great joy. But it's good news. It's not just, as some like to say, not just good advice that Jesus brings. Not just good intentions that he brings, but good news. That is, it is a proclamation, even as Augustus offered... uh, (laughs) offers a proclamation. The angel here says, I'm bringing you good news. And essentially the news is, and we'll see this in a moment, is the news that we have a Savior. The incarnation brings salvation from sin and death and God's wrath. So good news of great joy. This child embraces the lowly and brings glory. This child brings good news of great joy, but this child also welcomes all. If you're not a Christian, you're not sure what you believe, not sure if this stuff is for you, this message is for Democrats, the Green Party, Republicans, the non-political, it's for rich and poor, it's for Methodists and Buddhists and Catholics and atheists, it's for rural shepherds and urban dairy farmer, farm traders. It's for sexual minorities and the gender dysphoric. It's for the religious and the irreligious. It's for ugly Americans and glorious non-Americans. This child welcomes all. It's for everyone. It's joy for everyone at Advent. This child is a savior who comes to the lowly, comes with glory, comes with good news of great joy, comes and welcomes all. And then finally, he's a savior. He's come to save you from your own rebellion against God and mine. And so the savior is born into the center of this message. What I want to do now is just move to the implications of this, the implications of the foundations of incarnational joy. And I'll just want to apply for a moment and speak to you directly and say, number one, as we sang earlier, prepare him room. I don't mean to be sentimental, but as Isaac Watts wrote in Joy to the World, let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. What he's saying is that if All of creation, based on Psalm 98 and Psalm 96, the the forests are going to to sing. Then you also should open your heart to him. Crown him your Savior. Crown him your Messiah. Crown him your Lord. Additionally, I'll say this, that I I just want you to recognize, for those of you who are tired of the uh, technocratic world that we live in, tired of the tyranny of the powerful, tired of the the tyranny of technology just to know that that will also soon be overthrown. Maybe you need a dystopian Christmas uh, movie this year to watch. If you haven't watched uh, The Children of Men, 2006 science fiction action thriller film co-written by Alfonso Cuaron. It's based on P.D. James's 1992 uh, Novel, if you need somebody who's well-known, Clive Owen plays Theo, okay? And uh, Claire Hope Ashiti is, uh, plays Key, who's sort of a Mother Mary figure. But it's set in this dystopian world of a police state where they're cracking down on immigrants. It's very dark. But the, the woman, in a, well, I had to add one more thing. It's a world that ha- is, has global infertility. And... And there's no reproduction, so the whole culture is beginning to die. And it focuses on this one woman who somehow becomes impregnated. And it's focusing on the power and simplicity of bringing an innocent child into the world. What this text is saying is that all of the weariness of the modern world and the institution of the empire that is so wearying to you, will one day, you will be free from it all. You will overthrow it because of this subversive manger. The third thing I want to just apply here is I want to think about community for a moment and the community uh, that you're a part of and the communities that are around you. I was talking to a friend, and he was giving some statistics from a talk that he had heard that 
after COVID, about 30% of church-going people or Christians have become more committed to their faith. And then about 30% have become uh, uncertain about what they're going to do with their faith. And then another 30% have really walked away from the faith. And this, this Savior that comes into the world is creating this new alternative community of a kingdom that he's calling you to be a part of. And when I listen to those statistics, 30, 30, 30, my first thought is that only adds up to 90%. So I'm not sure what happened to the other 10%. But I just want to challenge you to, in this late COVID period, know that we live in this time of disorientation and there's a great temptation to move away from that manger to move away from the centrality of that subversive story of Christ coming into the world. I also just want to say to those of you who who don't feel joy, because it says this is good news of great joy, and for some people that's like a condemning thought, because you could sit here and say, I don't actually feel joy in the Advent season. Everything is dark for me. Everything is dark unreal or, de be, or debilitating. And I just want to say that um, don't punish yourself if you don't feel joy. <laughs> because joy is not just an emotion, it's a certainty of what God is going to do in the world. And it's possible in the midst of discouragement and depression to still rest on the certainty of the subversive manger that he's bringing into the world. I was talking with a, a congregant yesterday about, anecdotally, just about the rise of anxiety and what it's done to the counseling profession, overwhelmed it in many ways. Uh, so this is a message of great joy, even for those who can't feel the joy, can't experience the joy. And then the last thing I want to say is... is uh, to just focus on this last word that, or this word that the angel says in verse 10, fear not for behold. And I, I want to encourage you to allow this subversive plan of God to overthrow all thrones, to bring a message of forgiveness because he's a savior. I want to uh, ask you to, to let it work on the fear of your heart and to think through what are the areas that you fear the most and what are those in what what are the ways in which you need to bring those fears to the edge of the manger to the king of all creation and ask him to speak into it born in a manger let our loving hearts enthrone him it's amazing what an overlooked child an invisible child so to speak can do but he is born this day to be Lord and Savior and Messiah. I don't pay too much attention to popular culture. Uh, but you, there was a, a moment recently when Adele was at a concert. And uh, she was singing. And then Emma Thompson set her up, asked her a question, and said, who's, the most, like, who's one of the people that's influenced you the most in the world? And she goes on, and she starts talking about her, a teacher that she had at a South London school she said, I had a teacher at the South London High School, Chestnut Grove, who taught me English. That was Miss McDonald. And she said, she got me into English literature. I've always been assessed, obsessed with English. Obviously, now I write lyrics. She says she was so bloody cool, so engaging. She made us care. And then all of a sudden, Emma Thompson in the audience is like, she's right over there. <laughs> and she comes on the stage, and she's like, keeps complaining that she's ruining her makeup because she's like crying, but they hug on the stage. And is this a little picture of someone who's sort of overlooked, someone who's kind of invisible to the rest of the world, being contrasted with someone who in our eyes has great power and great fame. And the message of this text is that the manger is going to overthrow all powers that are existent in this world. Let me put it this way. The mighty will fall by the humblest 
of them all, who is Jesus, and who has come to be our Savior. So let every heart prepare him room and recommit to this joy-renewing Savior and to his community, for he will topple all things, including your sin, including death, including the wrath of God. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the power of this uh, subversive child, so unnoticed, wrapped in these swaddling clothes as a sign, as a sign that the weak will overthrow the powerful, as a sign that the proud will be scattered in the thoughts of their hearts, as a sign that glory will be brought into the world and that even humble shepherds might receive this new kingdom. And we pray that that message would be a comfort to us, those who feel overwhelmed by anxiety and those whose hearts are already full. Bring your peace to us again through the foundation of the joy-giving incarnation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.